Hi guys, Phil here. Something a little bit different for you today as we deal with our burst water pipe in the gym. So I've dug up an old episode from 2018 in August with Cutting Wines director Dan Radford talking all about organic wine as we all need a drink after what happened yesterday in the gym. So uh, check out the show notes for a little bit inf- more information about what did happen and um, also a bit of information about how you can help us out during this challenging time. Hope you guys enjoy the show and we'll be back to a normal tomorrow. We're live. <laughs> the microphones are on. I know. Okay. What's up, everybody? Uh, Yanni here again. We are back with Unity V and also the Sound of Movement podcast, which I will start recording now. Uh, thanks, Rad. Today we, ha- we are super pumped. I've got the full crew here. We got Rad back, as you can kind of see in the corner of my shot here. And we've got a good friend of ours, uh, Dan Radford, who is um, a wine, I would say, uh, expert. I was gonna say guru, but I don't throw that word around lightly. He is, he is honestly, he's been in the game for a long, long time. And uh, in, in like 10 minutes of talking, I've learned more about wine than I knew in my entire lifetime before that. So. I'm super excited to uh, get Rad to introduce him um, in just one moment. All right. All right. Welcome to the show, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yeah. Pleasure to have you, man. So um, for those of you that don't know Dan, he is, uh, he's a member of our gym, uh, but more importantly, he's a good friend of mine. Um, we were actually going, uh, having a little reminisce just the other day and talking about when, when we met and we, uh, we could put it down to, uh, it was either January or February in the year 2000 uh, and I know that so well because uh, I had just come out of uh, a plaster cast on my foot, uh, I'd had an injury from, uh, from my short career as a stuntman um, and Dan was my uh, manager at a bottle shop in Cremorne called Liberty Liquors. Yeah, it goes going, back. Going way back. Going way back, hey? And then, uh, of course, Liberty Liquors was bought out by, um, by Woolworths and uh, it turned into First Estate and BWS. And uh, Dan and I went, went on to doing um, bigger and better things. And um, for, I guess the reason why we, we got you on the show today, Dan, is because, um, as Yanni just said on the intro, I didn't know anything about wine or, or really sort of... Uh, any alcohol before I started working with you. And it was when I started working with you, I, I, I had an interest in you. You just started talking to me about the different types of wines and uh, beers and where they come from. And, and that's where I learned the limited amount that I, uh, that I now know. Well, look, I won't take all the credit for your knowledge, <laughs> mate. Uh, I, I'd give it to you, honestly. I don't, I don't, I don't think I've, uh, I really don't think I've learned anything of any value around, uh, around different wines and, uh, and beers that I, that I haven't learned from you. And um, so tell us a little bit about yourself, Dan, from, uh, from then to now. Um, so back when you were the manager of, uh, of Liberty Liquors and then you went over, you were managing... Um, what was that place that we worked at under the Metropole Hotel? What was it called? Uh, hotel Cremorne. Uh, yeah, yeah, but what was the bottle shop called? No, it's, it's it was part just the Hotel Cremorne, Cremorne Bottle Shop. Cremorne yeah. bottle shop and then, uh, to my understanding, you went on to become a rep, a wine rep. Is that right? Yeah, so pretty much from uh, managing uh, and changing the store down for Hotel Cremorne because they uh, <laughs> poached me from Liberty Liquors. Yep. Uh, and then pretty much worked my way up to uh, Licensee at Hotel Cremorne, um, did that for, you know, over the six years, uh, and as much as I would like to say I, I love the game, I love the hotel game, I didn't prefer the, the late nights, yeah. so I decided, um, you know, maybe to start looking around and see what else was out there. Uh, I got approached by a company by the call uh, Young and Rashley Wines, mm-hmm. um, who I've dealt with, um, especially through all the the bottle stores uh, and hotels mm-hmm. that I'd worked at. Um, and the uh, the gentleman at the time, Cal, he said, "Hey, listen, you're looking to get out. We might have a position for Young and Rashley." And I said, "Yeah, absolutely. Let's uh, let's get into it." Yeah. And um, yeah, a uh, bit of a lifestyle change, a bit of a pay cut, but certainly uh, my interest in wine was always around, um, 
you know, learning more and, and gaining more knowledge. I don't think you ever know everything about wine. I think you still learn things. I still learn things now, um, you know, even by chatting to other people that have been probably in the game longer than I have. Mm. You just come and ask me if you need to know. Yeah, look, I'm trying, seriously. <laughs> I, I <don't. laughs> um, but, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so then Young and Rashley, I was sort of there for three, three or so years and then, I decided mm, I didn't want to just be a sales rep for the rest of my life uh, and an opportunity came up within Young and Rashley um, to possibly buy into a um, sister company, I guess you'd call it, called mm-hmm. Cuttings Wine Merchants um, with another gentleman, Justin Walters, and uh, yeah, we started to create Cuttings Wine Merchants. Um, uh, build it from, you know, I guess ground zero and uh, to where we are today, which yeah. is uh, seven or eight years on. So, yeah, um, awesome. yeah so I guess, you know, uh, our business is, is selling wine to anybody with a liquor license or, yep. um, you know, very close friends, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, we build our portfolio, um, you know, probably a little bit more boutique wines. Um, yep. You know, certainly designed for more on-premise, um, but certainly still do with the off-premise side of things. Um, and when I say on-premise, you know, restaurants, cafes with liquor license, yep. uh, restaurants, hotels, um, online businesses that have a liquor license. So, um, and then and then retailers. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a broad section of of um, clients that, that that we deal with, which is great. Uh, and uh, you know, I still love hospitality. Uh, I thought yeah. I possibly I might get out of it one day, but um, certainly now that I'm in the wine side of things, and uh, you know, I learn uh, you know more and more each day. And and you know, you, I mean, what a job to have to taste wine and yeah. <laughs> see uh, see what the wines are like, and yeah. if it's a new vintage or it's a new product or a, or a new varietal, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know, I continue to uh, to learn. Yeah, yeah, good. for sure. And um, so, I, I mean, I remember over the years that I that I worked with you, uh, you were often doing um, wine appreciation courses as well. So yes. you, you know, I remember, you know, you'd tell me, "Oh, I'm going off to do this uh, wine appreciation course tonight for for this and that," and then you'd come back with some with some new knowledge about it. And and yep. and the amount that I learned. Um, from from you just in the times of, uh, of of feeding off that was enough to when I go out to a bottle shop with people I always seem to know more about the wines than than anyone that I'm that I'm with um, and my knowledge is just so limited compared to someone that really knows what they're talking about but um, I guess what led us I'm, I'm going to just share with everyone sort of what led us to having you on here you know we um, over the years. Um, You know, you only get to see each other, uh, you know, here and there, and we didn't get to see each other for a few years, and and, uh, um, you you came into the gym recently, you wanted to, uh, you know, get back into the gym, and and, and when we were talking about what you were doing, I thought you were still... um, uh, involved in a, in the vineyard that you were that you were working with or uh, being a wine rep, and you told me that now you were running your own wholesale company and yep. uh, and everything. And, and I I remember of, I remember the conversation. I said, "Oh man, yeah, you know, I, I just can't drink uh, wine." And you said, "Why not?" And I said, "Well, I've tried so many different amounts of it, and I've found that even if I have one glass of of a, of a red wine, I'll still get a, a bit of a headache the next day." And you laughed at me and said. It's not wine, mate. It's the quality of wine that you're drinking. And I said, well, what do you mean? And, and you said, well, you know, what are you drinking? And I told you, and it was the big name wines that you can get at any of the, of the big bottle shops. Um, and I thought I was drinking a, a decent wine because I'm spending 15 bucks on it. I'm not spending like six bucks on a bottle. Um, and you laughed and told me, um, this, this is what you said anyway, which is that when, when a big wine company gets wine, they'll get maybe 15% of their grapes from this vineyard and 20% of their grapes from this vineyard and 30% from this vineyard. And, uh, and then they'll put it all together and they'll taste it and it doesn't really taste the way they want it to so they'll put some sulfates in it or whatever it is and they'll taste it again and by the time you get the finished product um, it's 10 or 15% preservatives and, and sulfates which is what causes that headache and uh, um, that resonated with me because I, I understood the concept of organic and biodynamic wines which is, uh, you know, to my understanding organic means that they haven't used any pesticides or herbicides in the process of even growing the wine, the grape for at least five years. Yep. Plus, they haven't uh, used any additives in the wine. Um, and then a biodynamic vineyard means they haven't actually had any preservatives or pesticides used on the soil at all. Um, 
Is that right? Why don't you let Dan explain it? Yeah, look, um, I guess, you know, if you're looking at organic wines, um, and uh, we talk about that just separately to the biodynamic side of things, um, organic wines are, you know, wines or grapes that exclude um, chemical um, uh, synthetics, um, you know, which might be in fertilisers, um, herbicides, um, fungicides, uh, you know, pesticides, those type of things. So, um, so the organic is still about the actual f- the land itself um, and the nutrients that the soil gives, um, and you know they try and grow the grapes within the realms mm-hmm. of what the land provides. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I guess you know they can still have preservatives uh, mm-hmm. in organic wine, um, and the biodynamic side of <coughs> of the, the you know the vineyards or grapes is probably a little bit more to do with you know they they follow it by the moon and the sun and and the water and and that's you know they grow everything by a calendar yeah wow um and that's that's pretty hardcore but you're right um it is a long process um for any vineyard to you know to be certified organic um it usually takes about five years um the vineyard as well as the winery has to be um organic yep um, and certified um one of the wines uh, one of the wineries which we we certainly focus a lot on and has certainly grown over the last few years is paxton wines um and they have a certified uh, symbol which is on the back of the of the label and it's uh, nasa and um you know it's, a, it's quite a, a heavy process they do get checked on quite regularly mm-hmm. um there are uh, vineyards and wineries within our portfolio that aren't certified organic, but they follow the organic practices. Um, mm-hmm. And there are wineries um, within uh, both the Young and Rashi and Cuttings portfolio, uh, like Rosalie, um, like Newdorf, uh, Tellurian, um, the, these guys uh, tend to have the the, the practices of organic, <coughs> but they just haven't got that organic um, uh, certification. Yeah, uh, it's so, and, and and that's just more on the vineyard alone itself. The, am I right in in um, asking? Is there uh, is there different levels of organic? Like, is there like um, I don't know where I read this years ago, but to get the actual certified organic logo, they've got to be like top level, and there's other sort of people that are trying to do different yeah look it, it is it's certainly harder with with vineyards um and a lot of it is to do with uh you know even your next door neighbor now if your next door neighbor's you know growing vineyards and they're using chemicals and sprays and things like that and that actually even goes across through to your uh, vineyard you, very hard to become um organic and biodynamic uh, and, and the reason for that is, is because as soon as that starts to affect the grapes, then you can't be organic. organic. Yeah, um, yeah the, you know, there's there's a lot of theory, you know, about, um, uh, you know, I, I guess biodynamic is, is also <coughs> another step up. They tend to have um, their own um, fertiliser, which is usually cow manure. Yeah. Um, Paxton's a classic. They um, have their cows and they don't, you know, they don't use any drenching um, you know, which sometimes can affect, um, you know, the, the, the manure itself, you know, yep. when you drench cows and stuff like that. So yep. they don't do that. Yep. Um, and so everything that you described about biodynamic and organic, again, that's uh, referring to the process of the way the grapes are delivered and the, and the growing of it, whereas uh, preservative-free refers to the fact that, they, that once they've got the final wine, they don't add preservatives to it. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So uh, sulfites are generally, you know, added, um, and sometimes that you know, can affect people. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's why some people do get headaches. There's no mm-hmm. doubt about that. Uh, the Paxton, you know, they created a, a wine that's now uh, called Now Shiraz. It's a naturally organic wine and it's um, no preservatives. So there's no added preservatives at all. So, um, which is... So we've actually got that here. Can yeah. I, um, can we get a shot, Yanni, of me yeah. with this one? You point it up at that camera there. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, this, well, actually yeah, okay. So here it is. Um, now I can, when I had this chat to Dan, of course I wanted to, uh, um, to ask, I wanted to try. I'll zoom in and do a super close up. Okay, so this is, uh, here we are. Let's have a look. Real close, there we go. 
Okay. Yeah, okay. So um, when, uh, when I had this conversation with Dan and, and he laughed at me and told me, no, it's not red wine or wine as to why you're feeling the headache, it's the quality of it. Um, of course, uh, I tried some of these wines and I did try these Paxton ones. And, uh, and I can tell you without a doubt that um, I've shared a bottle of this with Alana. So we had, well, that would be four standard drinks. Um, in, you know, you in, all know he had it <laughs> <all> himself. <laughs> and um, it was not only the, some of the best red wine I've ever tasted by a long shot, but I did not get a headache or even a smidgen of a hangover the next day. Um, it really, really made a difference to the stuff that I'm used to drinking. Yeah, look... I guess the thing is, is that, you know, if you're going to drink two or three bottles of um, preservative free wine, you're going to get a headache because yeah. it's actually the alcohol. It's, it's probably going to do that. <laughs> there's, no, but, there's no hiding a hangover if you're a pisshead, <laughs> folks. <laughs> yeah. If you're going to drink two or three bottles of wine, you're probably still going to get a hangover. Um, I guess the thing is, is that when you look at, uh, you know, preservative free or low preservative wines, um, uh, you know, and you want to have a couple of glasses, uh, you know, yes, you won't um, probably notice the sulphites or, you know, you won't wake up the next day feeling like you've been hit by a truck. Yep. Especially to those people that um, do get affected by it. Um, yep. So, uh, yeah, look. Man, for me, personally speaking, I can really notice a difference. Yep. I was I was really blown away. When you told me what you said, I was like, oh, yeah, we'll see. And it, honestly, it was like night and day for me. And Alana felt the same as well. Alana felt the difference. And it's, I mean, it's a quality. Those are quality wines, those Paxons. They're so much better than anything that I've really tried. I've, I mean, I've, look, I've had some, um, I've had some Penfolds bin 389s and some 60 or $70 retail bottles before, and, and I would put this up against it any day. Yeah, look, I guess the other thing, you know, we, and something that I actually talked about, Yanni, just before we, we got on, uh, on air, I guess, um, is uh, single vineyard wines. Um, that's another uh, area that I think people probably would like to know more about. Yeah, one this of, was a big one for me as well because yeah. I didn't understand this. So single vineyard is a, a site where the the winery or the vineyard owner solely gets that grape and they can maintain it and control it within the realms of the climate, the soil. Um, so there might be variation due to um, you know what's happening with the climate or you know um, soils or, or whatever's going on but the thing is is that you're always going to get quality and and pretty much a consistency yep. with that particular vineyard because mm -hmm. it is single vineyard um, the other thing is, is that when you start talking outside of single vineyard there are some companies and you sort of reflect on that that they're bigger companies um, and you know they they're all about obviously quantity um, mm -hmm. obviously selling a lot more um, to, to mass produce to, to keep up with the, the demand yep um, to do that yes they, they do need to go and you know use other vineyards or, or sometimes they have other vineyards of their their own that they that, that they use but therefore it might be a, a Chardonnay a vineyard there and then another Chardonnay vineyard there and then they might use those two vineyards um, um, and blend the grapes together mm -hmm. um, with I guess that side of things, you know, the, the Chardonnay in one particular uh, site would be really, really good and then possibly at another site not as good. So that what they can do is actually blend the, the two, you know, the, those sites or three or four or five mm -hmm. sites, whatever the case might be. And there might be some idiosyncrasies for some of these vineyards. Yep. Um, so therefore, when you balance it out with, you know, some of the, the better um, Chardonnay, I'm using Chardonnay yep, yeah. as a, an example, um, you can sort of balance the quality of the wine a little bit more. Yeah. So, um, you know, th there's nothing wrong with that. But I guess, you know, when you're looking at single vineyard wines, you you you're truly getting the nature of that particular site. Yeah. Um, and you, I guess, appreciate more what's happening within that particular site because you know what's going on. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, look, it's... There are there are so many different factors of yep. of, of wine. Um, yeah, you know we we talk about uh, another thing that that's uh, that's starting to that gets asked a lot more is vegan wines. Um, mm -hmm. You know there are a lot of people out there that, that follow the vegan side of things. Um, this is an interesting topic. Pay attention, vegans, because I had no idea about this, and it's something that most vegans I think probably don't know, and for therefore probably aren't actually vegan. 
Yeah, that's right. I, I guess, um, you know, the wines, um, bef you know, the final process to go through a filtration process and um, a lot of the wines uh, these days, well, certainly in the past, uh, used um, egg white as a filtration or um, fish eggs or, you know, animal products, I guess. Yep. Um, yep. There are a lot more wineries now um, that are not u not using those particular um, filtration um, mechanisms. mechanisms. Yeah. So, um, and you know, we we have some wineries in our portfolio that are vegan friendly. Yeah. Um, you know, Toysner is, is a is one of those particular the brands that, that um, you know goes down that path. Just hold that hold that up a tiny. <clears throat> oh, hang on. We'll do a close up on Rad again. Toysner. Toysner yeah. and um, so that's a vegan wine for the <laughs> vegans out there. Awesome. There is certainly, without a doubt, uh, a lot more interest in biodynamic, organic, vegan, natural wines, um, mm -hmm. and the growth, I guess, is because there's a lot more talk about people talking about how healthy they want to feel mm -hmm. uh, and I guess that's part of you know when we talk about you know gym well, well that's that's massive man because yeah. that is something that uh, that's that that was a real a, a big interest point for me to try some of the ones that I've tried in your portfolio Dan um, you know a lot of people do drink wine <coughs> excuse me for the health benefits yep. and I'm doing little quotations here because I think um, what we were speaking about before we went live is I think a lot of people aren't realizing that when they you know get these health benefits from wine they're also drinking all this rubbish if they're if they're not understanding what goes into the wine and whether or not it's organic or it's single vineyard or any of that stuff and for those of you um especially for unity gym members that are interested um we are going to organize uh, a wine tasting down at unity gym i've already been speaking to dan about this it's something that he does yes so <laughs> uh next monday morning at uh, 8 a.m we're all going to be getting uh walloped <laughs> down here uh so we'll get your training out of the way first no it's uh i'm lying we usually save our drinking until 10 a.m on mondays so we might <laughs> no we'll uh we'll, we'll organize it up we'll figure out a time that we can do maybe friday afternoon evening or saturday or something but um dan's uh d this is something that dan does and he's going to take us through showing us what single vineyard wines are like how they differ what biodynamic wines are what some different grape varieties are what some what did you call it the uh, the true wine or the Natural. Well, natural wine. Natural wine. Can you explain that a little bit for us? Because I'd never even heard of that before. What's a, what's a natural yeah, wine? Yeah, so natural wine is, is starting to be a, uh, a little bit more, uh, it's almost a movement to say uh, it's a it's a nose-to-tail approach on wine, um, extending from the vineyard to bottling. Um, it, it still has the organic and biodynamic philosophies but it can um, still have sulfur dioxide added to it. So yep. uh, it, it probably, you know, a lot of people think that natural wines um, are the next best thing. Yeah, uh, but not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there isn't a lot of filtration. Um, it's, you know, they're small quantities. Um, they're usually quite expensive. Um, and, and what is it? What, what, why, why is it called a natural wine as opposed to... Well, it's just pretty much grapes going straight in from, you know, uh, barrel straight into a bottle. Without, yeah, right. Without any... Uh, and you'll see a lot of it is cloudy. Yeah, right. Okay, uh, so they don't filter it or anything. Yeah, yeah. correct. So the, the, um, hypothetically, you would say this is what they would have been drinking like a thousand years ago or Correct. thousands of years ago. So when you see like yep. Ga Game of Thrones and they're drinking wine, yep. it's all cloudy and, and yeah. you know, white or red or even rosé or, you know, any of those particular... Yeah, it is quite cloudy, but yep. not necessarily has to be, um, but you do see a lot of that now. Um, so that's why they were ruthless fighters. They were less hungover. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, they probably were. Yeah. The thing about... Um, uh, and I, you know, to clarify, this natural wine um, doesn't have a lot of longevity either. Uh, yeah. You know, probably six, twelve months, and really any time after that, um, yeah. you know, it, it, it really doesn't last as long. Doesn't and especially well, also yeah. once it's opened, yeah. um, it doesn't. You know, once you've opened it, natural wine can change within twenty-four hours. Yeah. Well. On, so. on that. Um, quickly, I want to give, uh, this is actually genuinely a question for me, so yeah, fuck everyone else. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean that, team. Um, how long can you keep a bottle of wine after you open it? 
Because Kalisha and I have this ongoing thing where she'll open a bottle of wine. She's, I'm looking at her right now up the back of the gym, uh, smiling. She'll have like one sip of a really nice bottle of wine on Saturday night and then save it for the following weekend. And I'm like, you can't fucking do that. It tastes like shit the following weekend. <laughs> am I right? Uh, am I wrong? Look, to be honest, uh, you know, look, I, I'm, you know, there, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of people that have thoughts and processes on this. I'll give you mine. Yep. Um, don't, don't worry about her feelings. No, no. Would, <laughs> I, would I drink a wine seven days later? I, I would try it. It certainly would not be as good as it is in the first three days. Look. Um, I, I would have to say that it, you've, you've certainly lost a lot of its um, character no. by the time. Look, you everybody get to knows when you open a bottle of wine, you've got about three hours to drink it. And then, I mean, well, that's what it look, is. Well, so. yeah. look, the, to be honest, the, 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 there's certain grape riders that, you know, you, you know, Chardonnay or a Riesling. Um, Shiraz, Cabernet, those type of grapes, you know, you can open them and then try them two or three days later and, and they, you know, they still uh, yep. are good. Uh, Pinot Noir, it, it, it really depends on the quality of the wine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a three or four dollar bottle of wine probably won't last more than two days. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the good thing about wine, and, and I, I think everybody needs to, you know, to, to think about this is, Wine changes and evolves, and it, all, it evolves from the moment it gets, you know, you know, picked through to it gets into the bottle, and even in the bottle it can change. And then by the time you get it through to opening it, it can change again. And then, you know, you might try it from, you know, I've certainly in my industry have tried a wine at 9am, um, and then I've looked at it again at 5 or 6pm, and there is a difference. Yeah. Um, it's worse or better? Like, is that because I've I've heard about uh, you know you need some, to let some a good wines wine do breathe. need to yeah do need to air yeah um, and a lot of the a lot of the younger wines sometimes tend to need to do that um, but also the reason for that is to get a little bit of um, you know the, the oxygen in there just to, to yep. create um, the wine to to give it a little bit more vitality I guess yep. so. Uh, you know, you, you can try wine the second day and yep. you might actually, some people even say, oh, it's even better than yep. when they the first moment, open yep. it because yep. it's just had a bit more time to, to evolve mm -hmm. again. So, you know, the third day, fourth day, yep, wines can still look good. Uh, you know, seven days is probably pushing it a little bit, but, you know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's okay. Each yeah. their own. Um, I think the thing is, is that you when, you, when you open a wine and you appreciate it and then you look at it again, you know, the next day or the next six hours or the next three days, you will think, okay, yeah, it has changed a little bit. Now, for the better or for worse, that is completely up to the individual. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can, I've always said that I can put, you know, a wine, you know, into a brown paper bag, give 20 people uh, the same wine and 20 people are going to give me different opinions. Yeah. Now, technically, I can't tell them what they're tasting. Yeah, I mean, I can advise them, but everybody's taste buds are a little bit different. So, just because you might taste something doesn't necessarily mean that person might taste something. Yeah. So, you know, I always argue that everybody that gives an opinion is right. Um, you know, that can be argumentative. <laughs> I like it. Uh, yeah. But I like it. look, at the end of the day, I think the fact is if people are talking about wine these days and and, uh, and are learning more about it, you know, it, it's good for the wine industry. Yeah. So, um, yeah. which. You know, we all want to be healthy. I think there's a lot more of a, a healthy kick on, you know, what we eat, what we drink, you know, what we're doing, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, not the youngest here so by far, but I certainly like to think that I'm trying to keep healthy in, in what I do and, and yeah. how I look and, and yeah. what I'm putting into my body. So, yeah. you know, wine, you know, that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Um, as I said, you know, you can put five bottles of wine in your stomach that isn't going to make you feel any better and certainly isn't going to be any healthier <laughs> but i think at the end of the day you 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 appreciate the wine a lot of bit, especially quality wine yeah. i think you actually understand a bit more you know a lot of the cheaper wine uh, and i don't want to certainly bag any any company out that's not what i'm about i think you know a lot of the cheaper wine these days you know um probably Tannin is a, is a classical example, I guess. Um, 
there is tannin in, in the grapes and in the stems and stuff like that. So and it's a compound, so therefore it you know it, it is. Uh, what is tannin? This is when you when you're tasting a wine and they say I can it's very tannic. tannic. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Or that's you know you said people. I know about wine. Some people that sometimes have a red wine like Cabernet Shiraz and they like, and they have this really. And yeah. quite, quite, that's that's the tannin side yeah. of things. Yeah. Um, so it's a compound that's done by the grape, and, and it's natural. But some there are bad and good tannins, mm-hmm. and sometimes I guess that the cheaper wine may not take out the bad tannin as well. Yeah. So yeah. which is bacteria and, yeah. and you know those, those type of things. So therefore, you know that may affect people as well. Um, sometimes you know wine is picked too early, for instance, and they might add. Um, sugar to yeah. give it a little bit more um you know fruit weight um i guess so mm-hmm. you know sugar is added as well so you know there are different aspects of of, of wine um you know i don't want to go too much into the technical terms but <laughs> you know look if if people as i say if we, we do this wine tasting and people want to come down and try some wines and you know they want to learn more about especially vegan organic natural um biodynamic then yeah let's let's crank it up and and certainly you know Maybe I mean, man, I'm I'm sure that there's some people out there that just want to learn about, um, and I'm going to put my hand up for this one. Just learn about the different grape varieties, you know, like yeah. what, what the difference between a Malot and a Pinot Noir and a Cab Sauv is, and things the, like that. The good thing about it, you know, and, and I still, as I, say, I still learn things every day, and, and I'm certainly not the most knowledgeable person in, in the wine world. But in terms of, you can try a Pinot Noir from the same region, but within different vineyards, and they can give off you know certain aspects that are quite quite different yeah and you think well hang on but it's all from that particular region well that doesn't necessarily mean that it's organized taste the same yeah but it's a good good way and you know we can do that here you know yep. if we wanted to where we could have all you know a Pinot Noir for instance or an all Shiraz from and you can actually see the differences yeah you can even see the differences between a biodynamic sometimes wine and a, and a, uh, and a non-biodynamic organic wine so you know education is great and, and I guess for me you know talking about wine and, and, and if somebody turns around and goes oh, I didn't know that then that's my job done yeah, I, yeah. as I said uh, just because I like a particular style of wine doesn't necessarily mean that someone else might but mm-hmm. I guess for me if someone actually appreciates appreciates the wine uh, that that's my job done mm-hmm. because then what you when you see is then the next person then tells that story on to the next people that they're drinking and then you know it, it, it is a, fo- a flow on effect and and for me you know that's that's what wine's yeah. all about I well think. i've never spoken about wine to people before having having your wines and you know talking about what different people get from a, a different wine um you've absolutely ruined me because alana <laughs> and i went to uh the bottle shop and bought a 15 dollars bottle of wine that we used to like and we were we were like turning our nose up at it we've turned into wine snobs now after, <laughs> after drinking some of your good stuff um, but I, think I think there's a difference between a wine snob and a wine appreciator. Yeah. <laughs> oh well, I like that. Yes. yes. Yeah. You can but take uh, to the bank. Um, but uh, I've definitely turned into a wine appreciator, and um, I wouldn't. I mean, I don't. I've never gone and bought a bottle of wine and gone and spoken about it to people afterwards before trying your stuff, and uh, I couldn't shut up about it. It was uh, it was really really good. So yeah, for those of you who are, who are Unity Gym members or, or friends of ours, um, look out. We will announce uh, the time and date uh, for the uh, wine tasting at, at Unity Gym soon, and uh, we're going to do a workout straight after it. So uh, however so, drunk you get, you're going to uh, anyone we'll that's not <laughs> Rad. Rad doesn't do wine tasting properly. He actually dr- he actually drinks the wine. He thinks you're meant to drink it all. Well, I've never you done are, a wine tasting, but, uh, but you're right. <laughs> you're, yeah. it's not actually it's not, about it's getting drunk, blind yeah. drunk. You it's know, actually, it's, uh, it is actually about when I do a wine tasting to spit the wine out. But that's completely up to you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just quickly on on that, um, c- could we talk about a few of your tips when you are looking for a good wine? Like, what do you look for? Because this is something like I've I've been to um, vineyards a lot, and you're always a little bit there's like when you're doing those cellar door uh, tasting, there's an element of um, like embarrassment. You don't want to sound like that dick in the in in the in the bunch that just knows absolutely bugger all about wine. So help me. Uh, to look better when I'm at the cellar door next time. <laughs> um, what can uh, what can what tips can you give me? Uh, look, 
you know, what do I look for when I go into a winery? Um, you know, sometimes it's actually just about the winery itself before you even try some of the wines. Um, sometimes you can walk into a winery and, you know, you, you're not really sure, you know, what their focus is or what their, you know, their, their bigger producing wine grape role is. So um, if you don't know the winery, then I would probably walk in and one of the first questions, and this is obviously more about you know, learning more about the winery is saying, hey, listen, just wondering, what, you know, what are your bigger productions on wine? Because a lot of wineries will focus more on Chardonnay or uh, because the, the, you know, the, the soil or the, or the vineyard is better um, equipped for Chardonnay or Shiraz or Pinot Noir. So I guess one of the, for me... It's, so you want to know what it is that they're focusing on? Yeah, and, 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 and look, you, the thing is that some people, you know, certain regions within Australia you know, around the world are, are better known for particular grape varietals. So um, you, if, you, if you want to learn more about a particular vineyard and, or winery, ask the questions of, okay, so what, what, you know, what's your biggest production? You know, mm-hmm. what, what grape varietal are you pushing the most? Mm-hmm. And, and, and why are you doing that? Um, and, and all of a sudden you'll start to, to, to gain the interest, I guess, of the, of the, the vineyard or, or the winery themselves because you're already showing, you know, an interest in what they do. Um, everybody has their favourite style of grape varietal. Uh, I think that's probably because we we grow up, you know. And, and I used to like um, Semillon, which is you know uh, when I was 18, 19, 20, you know, I liked Semillon grape. But I don't drink that now. I'm, I've moved to Chardonnay. Uh, I think your taste buds change. But I think you're also well. The five dollar casks of Semillon don't yeah, they, taste they, as good was, as the was, Chardonnay. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> university days. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I think I think the thing is is that you you've got a. I, I always say if if you're walking into a bottle shop or you're walking into a cellar, try every wine mm. if you can, because you you as I said I still learn things every day. If you try every wine or just even taste it, you don't need to swallow it, Rad. You just need to, you just need to taste it. He never spits it. Um, well, yeah. no. <laughs> Big problem. But I think, we went there. But I think, you know, it's one of those things that you, if you try the, whatever it is that they've got on, on tasting, you will turn around and go, you know what, I really like that and I didn't know I liked that. Mm. And, it, and it's the same thing that people say, oh, I don't like Chardonnay. Well, okay, why don't you like the Chardonnay? Is it because that you had a really bad Chardonnay, for instance, that was overly oaked and you, you, mm-hmm. you, it was all too woody? I've tried like, to nah. tell the Siani, he tells me he doesn't like white wines. But, but you know, the thing is, is try everything because yeah. you will suddenly be surprised um, what you actually do and don't like. Yeah. Um, and there are going to be some wines that you will turn around and say, yeah, you know what, I still don't like it. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. That's just your taste buds and that's just what you're not into. So there isn't, as I said, there isn't a right and wrong answer for the person that's tasting the wine. Um, what do I look for if I'm going to particular regions? You know, if I'm going to Tasmania or, or um, New Zealand or, um, you know, Victoria, you know, Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays, uh, you know, they're, they're quite well known for those type of things. Um, Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand. Um, you know, you can go to the Hunter and Semillon Chardonnay Shiraz. Um, you know, these, uh, you know, McLaren Vale can be um, uh, Shiraz as well. Regions within Australia, um, you know, are better known for particular grape varietals, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't do other ones. And it just depends, again, when we talk about the climate and, and the soils and everything else that are around it. If, the, if they've got a chance to grow it and it works, and then they'll continue to keep, you know, to keep um, producing it. So, yeah, cool, yeah. cool, awesome. So the basic, um, what we spoke about before, tannic. How do I know that a wine's tannic? It hits the back of my throat a little bit more. Um, t- tannins, are, tannins can be anywhere. They they could be at the front of your mouth. They can be in the middle. Yeah, um, really. They can be at the back. What's the, the difference between a tannic wine and an acidic wine? Um, acidic wine is actual the, the grape itself. I mean, they both have tannins and they both have um, acids. Acids, yeah. So you know, some some will. Uh, you'll, you'll usually whites generally have a lot more. You know, like a riesling 
or a semi on and stuff like that, you'll notice a lot more of the, the acid yep. structure coming through. Um, tannins, um, probably you notice a lot more in reds. Yep. So Cabernets and Shirazes and things like that. You can still get tannins in Pinot Noir and things like that. But generally, if they're integrated well, you, you don't really notice it as much. Um, yep. You know, tannin, yeah, it, it just depends on how the, the wine's made. Yep. Um, and, you know, you, you will notice a tannin, and it can be right at the front where you, you're almost puckering your lips. Yep. And then there's tannin that, as you say, at the back where you, you yep. almost feel like a glass of water. Yep. Um, that's just how the wine's, you know, made and, and what they've done to it. So, uh, yeah. And, and when they say, when you hear some wine snob sipping it going, oh, I get notes of summer and... Um, I don't know. Plum, rose plum petals and rose petals in yeah. the aftertaste. Where? Okay, so let's just go and and hypothetically say, okay, that all of that is true, and that person is genuinely tasting and receiving all of those sensations. Where are they coming from? Like, is that the, the it's soil? Usually, it, it's is usually it, from the grape. It's, it's from generally the grape. from the grape. So, and, the, and does the grape pull that from anything particular, or is it just the the strand of grape, just the the, um, the look, type it, of grape? Yeah, look, you know, you you talk about uh, Sauvignon Blanc from say New Zealand, and there is a perception that they're you know passion fruit and gooseberry and things like that from Marlborough particularly. Yep, um, that's generally what the grape itself is is giving off. Um, yep. So you know. Um, uh, a rosé, for instance, that's made from Pinot Noir grape yep. will usually give off a little bit more of that strawberries and cream rose petal. So, yes, it's it's generally the grape itself. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, it can be also the other factors of how the winemaker or, you know, wants to produce the wine itself as well. So th- there is a certain style that the grape is giving, but they might um, go, well, listen, I'm looking for a little bit more, um, you know, Variation in the, in the grape, so they might say, "Well, let's try and go down this path." And you know, for Cabernet, might, well, instead of going sort of a black currant, they might go a little bit more. But it, it's it really depends on the grape itself and, and and how it's evolved through through the climate, through the you know growing, um, you know what how you know when it was picked, if it was early, if it was late. Um, you know, the I could get into the technical ty- you know, terms and say. You know, bow maids and all these type of things, but it, it, it does come down to the winemaker and what they're looking for out of the grape and what they want to, you know, produce, you know, for the for the client or for the consumer. So. Yep. Cool. Um, what the only th- about the only thing I do really know about wine, la- uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for those of you interested, is that the health benefits of wine come from an antioxidant in the wine called resveratrol, which is only in the red grape. And uh, the research that I've done indicates that the colder the climate that the grape is produced in, the more of that resveratrol is produced in the wine. And it's, a, it's, it's like a, um, a safety mechanism for the grape to protect itself. Uh, so in the colder climate, it has to sort of defend itself a little bit more to survive. And it seems that there is more of that resveratrol produced. So the Pinot Noirs are usually the colder climate grapes aren't they correct um so if you want the resveratrol benefits which is an amazingly powerful antioxidant let me be absolutely clear it helps to strengthen what's called the endothelium in the body which is a a a fatty connective sort of web that holds all of your cells together it helps to um, keep your skin stretchy and elastic it does all sorts of amazing things so resveratrol in the right amounts is very very good for you meaning red wine in the right amounts is very very good for you and uh, there are also some some um, good studies to prove that it's good for your cardiovascular system within moderation so rad's style of drinking is completely out ladies and gentlemen <laughs> Um, I'm in the firing line here, am I? He's getting smashed. Yeah, right. yeah. Dan, you've just tried our uh, kombucha. What do you think? Um, yeah. I, firstly, what is it? Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a fermented drink. It's basically fermented sugar. So we've all heard about uh, the tea and sugar. The, yeah. the well, yeah, but the bacteria really comes from fermenting Sorry. sugar, doesn't it? So the. Um, uh, we've all heard about how our digestive system is strengthened with the good bacteria. You see all those Inner Health Plus ads and your Coolt and things like that. But the problem is that mass-produced foods, and especially the dairy industry, um, they have to... What's it called? Um, 
not, not hydrogenate. They have to poly... What is it? Oh, pasteurize. They have to pasteurize uh, their foods. And pasteurization is a process where they kill bacteria, um, Dan, so it's more um, uh, commercially viable. You know, they can um, send it all across the country and across the world sometimes, and people aren't going to, uh, you know, die from some bacterial infection. So when you're having a, a, a drink that, that claims to have health benefits from bacteria, it's important that it's non-pasteurized. So that kombucha isn't pasteurized, and it's basically just, just putting down uh, a whole bunch of good bacteria in your digestive system uh, to help uh, with health, help with inner health. Yeah, I, I, I've never, never heard of it and never tried it, but the fact that it has organic on it, which is obviously <laughs> <laughs> quite uh, quite hard, yeah. Quite passionate quite about. Quite pa passionate yeah. about. And that bottle, you? that bottle actually has uh, seven, uh, no, twenty-seven calories in it. So, because all of the sugar is eaten by the bacteria in the fermentation process, there's there's virtually uh, no sugar left in it. And uh, so, in terms of you know wanting to sustain a healthy weight, um, you can drink a, drink a couple of those a day, and you certainly won't won't put on any weight from it. And when are you meant to drink it? Uh, not when you're fasting. Yeah, right. That's when you're not meant to drink it. Probably, so, probably not right. Uh, uh, that's all right. That's why I'm not drinking one now. I'm actually doing a 24 hour fast today. Um, basically, just when, you, when you're not fasting, mate. And you wouldn't want to have more than two bottles a day. Okay. Uh, like anything, anything it's wants actually, to be had in good. moderation. It's good, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. This one that you're drinking, uh, I'll just get a um, shot of my bottle here. Um, this is a hibiscus kiss. And the reason why I'm a big fan of the hibiscus, where am I lining that up? Okay, there. That's a product shot there. Shout out to Remedy Kombuchas um, for supplying us with delicious kombucha. They're probably one of the best. And they're one of the ones, you've got to be very careful. Kombucha, guys, I'll get back to hibiscus in a sec, I digress. But kombucha is one of those things that has become mainstream and very, very popular. Uh, just like 100% um, uh, uh, pure wine. And they, there are a lot of companies that aren't doing it right. They add sugar and flavouring to it. So you've got to be very careful which kombucha Or even pasteurise them. Um, yeah, a lot of them pa uh, actually pasteurise them, which is completely stupid because it kills all the bacteria. A lot of them add sugar to sweeten it and add um, uh, processed flavours, and that just ruins it. So Remedy, and there's only a couple out there that are really, really good. Anyway, back to hibiscus. Hibiscus has a chemical in it that's, um, that's been found to upregulate cell autophagy. So, Cell autophagy is that, we've spoken about it before, is that healing process, the body's ability to restore its cells. Anyway, I digress. Uh, we are at the 46 minute mark, which means that we've managed to talk about healthy organic wine with Dan, the man, for 45 minutes, which is amazing. Anyone who, um, who knows us at Unity, I'd love to go to our big wide angle shot, but uh, we didn't plug the camera in properly and it's run out of batteries, so we've lost it. Uh, but, that was really good, man. Yeah, that was mate. freaking awesome. Thank and you. I've learned so much about wine, and I can't, I can't stress this enough. I'm going to put up the um, Dan's website uh, again on here. No, that's our website. Uh, there we go. Cuttings. Um, he's over the last couple of months been supplying us with real wine because he heard he. He heard a rumor that I was drinking cheap, shitty um, Audi wine. That was rad. <laughs> but you know, we have we are on a budget and all that sort of thing. And, and I thought, oh well, it can't be that bad. Um, and then Dan showed me the light, and he started supplying us with really, really good wine. And as Rad said, holy crap, it's uh, it's um it's phenomenal. And over the last month, you've sort of. We've given you a bit of feedback and you've sussed out our palate. And, yep. and the last box of wine that you gave us was like every bottle we opened was just next level, knock your socks off. So if you guys are, are, are interested, which really all of you should be, anyone watching, we've got a few people watching live and I'm sure many, many more are gonna listen to the podcast or watch this video because it's a really important topic. Remember, what you put into your body counts. And this is on a, uh, a, a like an environmental level, what we breathe, but also what we eat, uh, what we put on our skin, everything goes through the filtration system. And yeah, let's be real, you know, we want balance in our lives. Rad and I are not, um, uh, we're not trying to be Satan. We don't want to tell you to give up the good things in life like good quality um, uh, craft beers and wine. Dan also does craft beers, which is a whole nother conversation that we'll save <laughs> to another day. 
uh, you need you really need to think about what you're doing, what you're putting in your body, and the in, in, and the quality of wine should be up there um, because you know some of us do drink wine for the health benefits, but if you're putting really really processed wine, as was I, um, earlier in the year. You're not getting the health benefits at all. You're just overloading your body and your filtration system with high toxicity. Dan's shaking his hand, and he's very, very passionate about this. We were we were talking about it before, and I he he took off um, before we even went live. So let's get, give give us your wrap up. What sh what should people do just to get themselves healthy, other than punch in the website that's on the screen right now and learn learn and start ordering better wine? Uh, I guess look, you know, if we if we organise a, a tasting or you know um, we want to do something on a regular basis, um, I'm happy to uh, to to help educate more people. Um, I, the thing is, is that wine is 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 a, a fantastic, fantastic thing that we all love to drink. But you're right. We also need to make sure that we know what we're drinking. And if I can help educate, um, please, you know, give me a give me an email, send me a message, um, talk to the boys um, here and and ask them. Um, but I'm happy to help out wherever I can. And uh, as I said, uh, the more the merrier when it comes to educating people with wine. And if, uh, if Dan doesn't know the answer, you can hit me up. I'll, uh, I'll help you out. <laughs> so what we'll do, guys, we'll, uh, for our Unity Gym members, um, we will be announcing the, uh, the wine tasting um, internally uh, through our Unity Gym support group page. And anyone that isn't a member of Unity Gym, if you do uh, want to be a part of that or uh, want to come along, just uh, send us a message uh, on Facebook and we'll let you know when we're going to be doing it. Fantastic. Awesome. Man, that was epic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks Thank for, you for your having time. me in. You are absolutely welcome. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to quickly uh, discuss one um, cool study that I've looked at, which I think will be beneficial to people. And um, other than that, uh, hit us up if you're interested in the wine tasting uh, and get yourself some healthy wine. Trust me, trust me, trust me. Try some really good quality wine if, you're, if you've been drinking wine on a budget. Uh, Dan will take care of you at Cuttings if you're, uh, if you're looking for a good supplier. And, um, and let's start looking at what we put in our bodies on a, mac on a micro level, not just a macro level with your food and the water that you drink, guys. Let's look at all the other things as well. Um, we would, I'd love to get you back on and maybe we talk about beer next time uh, because I know you, you're, you, you guys also specialise in really good quality craft beer. Rad and I are, are, not, um, are not shy of a, uh, of a good beer. We yeah, Yanni specialises in all beer, I think. <laughs> <laughs> give, give me all the beer, yeah. <laughs> When I asked how many I drank, I said all of them. Um, no, look, uh, that was really good, mate. Thank you very much for giving up your time. I think that we gave some really good value to people out there, uh, myself included. I'm learning a lot, and I'm very much enjoying the wines that you're bringing in uh, for us. It's fantastic. No, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Dan. Thanks, yeah, mate. So thanks. All right, we'll let, Dan, we'll let Dan go so he can get back to uh, what he does best. And um, will I see you at lunchtime today for a workout, or are you going to miss it because of uh, the time you've given us? No, no. I feel guilty if I'm not going to be here. So yeah. uh, there's one thing that I've noticed that um, coming to Unity Gym for me uh, has become a bit of a um, part of my day. So uh, yeah, I'll awesome. definitely see you guys. Awesome, awesome mate. Cheers. No Thanks. Thanks very much. Cheers. Mate. Thanks a lot. See you, bro. Thanks see you, dude. All right, tribe. It's time to talk study review, uh, and this is a this is an easy one. And for some of you, it might seem really really obvious, but um, I'm going to talk about it anyway. Uh, as you guys know, um, I am a big fan of muscle hypertrophy and all things that support muscle hypertrophy. That is the growth of muscle tissue. Um, let's be honest, Rad and I and a lot of the guys at Unity here aren't getting any younger. We're all sort of pushing that 40 mark and 50 mark and for some of you 60, the guys that have earned it. Uh, and one of our priority goals is to maintain muscle tissue. I'm going to set this up so we get both of us in the one shot. Uh, so the study that I looked at this week um, that I liked the idea of is that, that, that because we all think that we need to smash ourselves to, uh, to get a good result in the gym. 
And one of the one of the cool things about muscle hypertrophy is that I'm just going to set this up so Rad and I both get our own um, mic. Can we? Well, I don't know. Can we do that? No, you can't really, can you? It's not going to work because we got these things hooked up. Yeah, no. no, it's not going to work. We thought we could do it, folks, but we can't. Uh, what we found, they, they, I'll, read the, I'll read the summary here. Uh, again, I'm, uh, I, I take these studies from uh, Coach by Tony Bataji. He has an amazing service. Whether you're a personal trainer or not a personal trainer, I highly recommend checking this out for around seven bucks a week. Here's the thing, there are so many good research studies that get published on a weekly basis and it's very, very hard to filter through them. Uh, you need to know how to interpret the data and not only know how to interpret, interpret the data, you've got to make sure that it comes from a reputable source because there are good journals and there are mediocre journals. So uh, this is a great service because I trust Tony and I trust his whole team and if these guys are uh, are reviewing the study, then chances are it is of a very, very high caliber and it's worth paying attention to. So we jump into Coach by Tony Bataji. Uh, I'll put a link again in the post if you guys are interested in this service where he publishes probably about five or six um, uh, reviewed studies every week that you can jump onto. So I'll read this verbatim from his website. All intensities above 20% 1RM effective at building muscle. Um, this study was designed to identify if there is a minimum loading to induce muscle hypertrophy. That's the growth of the muscle cells. What they did, uh, 30 men volunteered to participate in a, in a weights program performed twice a week for 12 weeks. The study employed a within subject design in which one leg and arm trained at 20% 1RM and the contralateral limb was, so the other limb was randomly assigned to one of three conditions, either 40%, 60%, or 80% of one RM. That means that they're doing 80% of what they could do for one rep only, okay? The GR, the, then they started the session with three sets to failure. So they controlled that, everyone did three sets to failure, but they were doing it at that um, intensity that they were designated to. After training, the number of sets was adjusted for the other contralateral limb conditions with volume matched uh, and 1RM were assessed at pre and post six week intervals and they also tested their strength, their 1RM strength at 12 weeks as well. Bear with me if this is a little sciencey, but this is important for people, especially when we're trying to maintain our muscle tissue into our later years. What they found was when low to high intensities of weight training were performed with volumes matched, all intensities were effective for increasing muscle strength and size. However, the 20% 1RM was suboptimal in this regard and only the heavier weight intensities, more specifically the 80% 1RM, was shown superior for increasing strength. So basically what they're saying here guys in layman's terms is, you don't have to train to a super high intensity to build strength and muscle hypertrophy, muscle size. Obviously, what we would think is that the higher intensities increase strength a lot more and they have a slightly better effect in hypertrophying, enlarging or maintaining the muscle tissue. But what I think is really important as a take home from this guys is when you're either injured or you're in a, a recovery phase or you're just fucking unmotivated for whatever reason, it's not essential that you come in and kill yourself in the gym. Training to even a 20% 1RM, which absolutely anybody can do, is enough to grow muscle and grow strength, develop strength. This is really important because like, you know, you, you're kind of led to believe that it's, 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 it's all or nothing. It's, it, you, you, are, you, you either go all out or, people don't go at all. And I think we see this a lot in the gym, right? Yeah, for sure, we do. You see uh, so many people have got this mentality that when you come to the gym, the only thing you come for is to absolutely kill yourself. And it's just not, not only is it um, not the right way to, to do it, but it, it can cause you a lot of problems. And that's why at Unity Gym, we, we follow the partial pyramid periodization 
model where we're, we ramp load for the first three weeks out of every month and in the third week we do a peak week where we get people to, if, as long as they're injury free, to try and uh, lift as much weight as possible and, and really increase their strength in that week and then we follow that with a deload week. And we've found that for the majority of people uh, that we train in North Sydney that that is the most effective way to achieve great adaptations, see really good strength gains but a very low risk of injury. I think what um, one of the big, most important things to take out of this is that probably the most Im most critical factor in, in, in any training program is consistency. It's the same with diet. You know, I had a really great discussion and I watched an amazing podcast again from my friend Ben Pakulski. I'll link it here uh, because he had a guest on um, Dr. Lane Norton, who Richie and I both really like following. He's uh, one of the smartest dudes I've ever seen. And, um, and they had a big talk about diet and diet related adherence. You know, uh, it doesn't really matter what diet uh, you follow the reason why people fail to lose weight is generally not because of the diet it's because they they suck it their adherence sucks they they, they drop off they, they they drop off the wagon so uh, this is the same with exercise you know and it's super important to understand that um, if to be consistent you can't always train at a hundred percent you can't always smash yourself and quite frankly it's more effective to undulate your periodization to have peak weeks like we do here at unity and to have back off weeks where we lower the intensity quite substantially now the other thing is that when you injure yourself or you have an issue there's always stuff you can do and there's always an intensity that will match the issue, you know, and, and all you need is the right guidance to sort of do that, you know. The other thing I'd, I'd like to, um, to, to sort of say about this uh, research paper, again, which I will link in the bottom of the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the page when we, when we repost this video, is that um, for new people who are just thinking about starting out, it's very, very important to understand. One of the things that turns people off is that, that, that a lot of personal trainers have the go hard or go home mentality. And so when you set foot in the gym, irrespective of your level of conditioning, many people will push you to breaking point. They think that's the best way to train because it, it, it does elicit a better a hypertrophy and strength result. But for a new person, the worst thing you can do is be turned off exercise, you know? And so knowing that for the first three to six months you only have to train at 20 or 30 or 40 percent and slowly the process of progression should kick in and you build that intensity up until you're training at your 80 90 and and, and for really conditioned people even at 100 percent a few times a year uh, that's very important so don't think that you have to step foot in the gym and you're going to get busted up and your trainer shouldn't do that it's it's not the right approach anyway so anyway for all those newbies have confidence training at 30 percent 20% even has been shown to elicit a great result uh, and then you should progress it from there. Any final notes from you, Rad? No, no, that's pretty much it, man. I think, uh, yeah, just uh, just be smart, listen to your body um, uh, and listen, listen to your trainer. There's a, there's a reason uh, why people um, pay uh, trainers to do what we do. It's uh, because we've, we've been around and we've been doing it for a while and we understand uh, what is best for people and what's going to deliver the best results. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. What a show, Tribe. That was epic. I'm pretty stoked to have, have had Dan on here. I learned a lot from him and I learned a lot about wine. Now, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to go, uh, I know it's been a little bit male dominant on the show, uh, but we have a couple of girls lined up who are, um, are coming on. I have a good close friend of mine who's an amazing dietitian, and uh, I'm really excited to have her on the show because she has just had her first child. And as, as a lot of you know, Rad, myself, um, have been, we've been pumping out kids like a little baby factory over here at Unity. Uh, and one of the questions that's come up recently from um, uh, people in our circle is what's the best approach when you're preparing to conceive? And uh, it, it made me think, wow, that's a, that's a whole show in itself that we could do and possibly two or three. So I've got a couple of girls lined up. I've got a dietitian and I've also got a naturopath who's really, really keen to come on the show. So we're going to have a, 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 a female discussion going forward. And it's not just female. That's, that's something that I should point out. It's very important for the men to it to take ownership of this too there are certain things that you should in our opinion be doing in preparation for uh, starting a family and one of them is just getting yourself physically conditioned for the sleep deprivation um, as you can see I've actually had a very good night's sleep last night but rad probably hasn't 
Uh, it's the hardest thing you will ever go through, ladies and gentlemen, having children. We've got a bunch of preg uh, pregnant people down here at the gym now. Part of it is the physical preparedness to be able to endure the pain of sleep deprivation and all of those things that come with it and that are associated with it. You've got to be strong in mind and strong in body. So I'm super thrilled over the next couple of weeks to have a few people on who can help with that, help with the nutrition side of things, and we can obviously add value by helping with the physical uh, conditioning side of things. Keep a lookout for that. Until then, folks, I cannot wait to uh, see you all again. I can't wait to get the podcast up. You guys can always, always find us on our Instagram page. You can also find us on our YouTube page channel there's all sorts of different resources out there uh, this video will be obviously posted to youtube as well thank you very much for joining us uh we'll get rad to thank everyone as well Thanks, um, guys. we are out tribe until next time thank you very very much